Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. Hello, and welcome to Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and so glad you've joined us today as we have a very special guest for today's program, United States Senator James Lankford from Oklahoma. Dr. Dobson has known Senator Lankford for many years and considers him a good friend and a good man. In fact, if every state in our nation had a U.S. senator with half the courage, moral conviction, and statesmanship as James Lankford, well, we would not be in the state of chaos and division that we currently find ourselves in. A couple of weeks ago, we sent a team from the JDFI to Washington, D.C. to attend the National Day of Prayer. Dr. Tim Clinton, co-host of Family Talk and president of the American Association of Christian Counselors, was among those who went. While in D.C., Dr. Clinton had the opportunity to interview James Langford in the senator's office on Capitol Hill. We are going to share that very conversation with you in just a moment. Now, before Senator Lankford was elected to the U.S. Senate in 2014, he served for four years as a U.S. representative for Central Oklahoma. And before that, James Lankford served families and students in a ministry capacity for 20 years, including 15 years as director of student ministry for the Baptist Convention of Oklahoma. When he's not on Capitol Hill defending traditional American values, Senator Lankford resides in Oklahoma City with his wife, Cindy. They've been married for over 30 years and have two daughters. Here now to introduce his guest and today's program is Dr. Tim Clinton. Senator James Lankford is a strong conservative and servant leader who is committed to God, family, and the Constitution. Elected to the United States Senate in 2014, James has worked diligently for all Oklahomans studying each issue and its direct impact on the family and individuals. He has earned the respect of his colleagues on both sides of the aisle for his knowledge on the pressing issues facing our country. While remaining passionate about life and traditional family values, he has become a strong voice for fiscal discipline and accountability in the federal government. He also has emerged as a leader in fighting government regulations that are suffocating business and weakening the economy, I think impacting the family. Senator Lankford currently uh, serves on the Committee on Finance, the Committee on Appropriations, the Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs, where he is chairman of the Subcommittee on Regulatory Affairs and Federal Management and the Indian Affairs Committee. In addition, Senator Langford chairs the Select Committee on Ethics and serves on the Senate Republican Whip Team. Uh, Senator Langford, such a delight to have you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. There's a lot going on. Glad to be able to do it as well. Senator, uh, Dr. Dobbs and his wife Shirley wanted me to convey their deep regards for your life in public service, standing strong on conservative issues, and for your love for the family. Uh, Wish they could be here. They wanted to shake your hand and just uh, tell you that in person. Well, it's always good to be able to see them and uh, grateful for their friendship. In fact, we ran into each other just a couple of months ago. We both ended up uh, flying into California, actually, for a meeting, uh, different meetings on it. But we actually just ran into each other at the airport uh, in this random meeting. We uh, I'd literally just stepped off the plane, walked right into him, and uh, we chit-chatted in the airport for a while. We got a nice California greeting with a Californian that uh, walked right up into our conversation and just started screaming at me, what are you doing in my state? I know who you are, and and just started screaming. And Dr. Dobson uh, started rising to my defense to say, this is a really good man, and he would just have none of it. Then he just started screaming at him as well and uh, walked off. So that was our, our California welcome to the sunshine. Scene. Only in California. Well, I, I wish it was only in California, <laughs> but uh, it, it was definitely a reminder we did just land in California. Elected officials in prayer. I wanted to start there. Um, we're here in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill, Senator Lankford's office. Uh, my wife, Julie, and I had the pleasure of uh, being seated with uh, Senate Chaplain Barry Black at a prayer event here. And I uh, talked about how often in this city, senators, members of the House, and more will come together, um, do a Bible study, pray often. I just wanted to ask you, I mean, what has been your experience while you're here? Uh, there, there are folks that say D- D.C. is such a swamp and it's terrible and it's awful. And there's, all, all that's here. But it, it, people would be surprised to know there are groups that gather Tuesday morning uh, for intensive Bible study, Wednesday morning for a prayer time and gathering, 
Uh, there are different fellowship gatherings around with different groups of believers that are here, both in the staff, interns that come in, uh, and members of Congress. We, I, I'm in a Bible study group, and there's some folks that come to the Bible study that have literally never been involved in a Bible study in their life, but they came here and thought, I need to learn more about Scripture, and they're getting involved. So I'm, I'm amazed to be able to tell people God is applying light to dark places, and that shouldn't be a shock, uh, but th this is a dark place. But God continues to be able to apply light here. That's He's always pursuing people in that, even here in this place. So I, I encourage people all the time when they say, I've just written D.C. off. I go, well, you know what? I don't think God's written D.C. off. So what he has not written off, we shouldn't write off. We should lean in and engage. Yeah. When it comes to National Day of Prayer, um, just kind of what's in your heart uh, right now as we move through the day and observe that moment on prayer. Yeah, there's there's a lot that really gets my heart on this. Um, I, I think about some things like recent Supreme Court case with Coach Kennedy, uh, where Coach Kennedy in Bremerton, Washington, was audacious enough after the end of the football game, he would just kneel down silently on the 50-yard line and thank God for keeping his players safe. For that, he was fired from his school district. Horrific. That, that, it was horrific on that. Uh, his school district said, you can't, we'll give you a place to go secretly pray if you want to do that. But it's literally the school district saying, you can pray, but only at a time and a place of our choosing. That's not who we've been as America. So literally his school district celebrates an individual who would kneel during the national anthem, but fires an individual who kneels to pray. Uh, both those are silent kneeling. Both those are protected speech and protected rights in America, at least they used to be. Well, that case has gone all the way to the Supreme Court. There are still Americans gathering to pray, and I believe the Supreme Court's going to look at that case, and they're going to say, that that's absurd that someone would be fired from their job for silently praying and just spending time alone with God at the end of a game, not compulsory anything. But we've got so many things to pray about right now. What's happening in Ukraine and Russia right now? Uh, what is happening uh, in different areas around Israel right now and the threats they're facing from a, an Iran that is trying to be a nuclear Iran and the real threats that they face? Yeah. What the economy, what's going on? People are struggling to be able to pay their groceries right now and fill up their tank. Uh, it's a different world for people. In addition, just all the hatred and the intensity of what's happening. The, the wickedness doesn't lead us to righteousness. And sometimes we get so angry and caught up in culture, we forget God is God and he's got a plan. So why don't we live our values and watch God do what only God can do and spend time in prayer saying, God, do you see this? And he'll respond, yes, I do. And I'm at work there. And it sets us at ease to go do the work we need to do. You know, the world changed. It went to a whole different place a couple of years ago when the pandemic hit. Yeah. You think about the lockdowns and the loss, yep. the loneliness, the uh, racial tensions, the rioting, the election, chaos. Um, COVID was like the gift that kept on giving. Of course, uh, Afghanistan, et cetera, but throw in censorship, suppression, and everything else. It's like, what in the world is going on? Yeah. To me, people are uh, they're filled with fear in some respects. You've got people who are confused. You've got media that's all over the place. They don't trust it. Um, they're angry. There's a stirring that seems to be going on. What are you hearing on the front lines? Yeah, all of those things and more. Uh, as people are frustrated with the, losing their job, the transitions, the cost of energy prices, trying to be able to fill up. If you're driving a big rig right now, it's $1,200 to be able to fill up your tank. I mean, it's just a whole different level uh, of stretch for a lot of people. So there are big issues that are facing. And when people come and talk to me about it, and I have the opportunity to be able to be face-to-face -face with folks or even in a public setting, uh, I'll often challenge them and say, all those are big problems. None of them are bigger than God. Amen. So let, let's take a deep breath and let's go to work. I, I always go back to the Nehemiah model. It's the place that I just return over and over to. Nehemiah, as a slave, 150 years after the fall of Jerusalem, the book opens. His brother Hanani, who's probably a slave as well, just came back from Jerusalem. And Nehemiah catches him and said, what's it like there? His brother Hanani says, it's terrible. The gates are burned. The walls are down. The people live in disgrace. And Hanani goes, it stinks to be them, and walks away. And Nehemiah drops to his knees and prays and says, God, what do I need to do? So you've got two people in the opening chapter of Nehemiah. Hanani, who looks at the problem and says, stinks to be them. And Nehemiah, who says, God, what's my part in making this better? And my challenge where we are in culture right now is to say, which one are you going to be? Are you going to be the complainer like Hanani and walk away? Or are you going to be the prayer and worker like Nehemiah yeah. that says, God, do you see all this? What do you want me to do about this? And then get God's leadership and then go to work. I choose to be the pray and go to work group. Amen. I love that. 
the American Psychological Association um, recently came out with a piece that highlighted the stress factor in the country. It talked about inflation, you just mentioned, yeah. talked about money stress, and talked about Ukraine and how those elements were absolutely driving people to the brink. And then I think it was recently, um, what was it, the Russian foreign minister comes out and says that nuclear options are on the table, blah, blah, blah. You know, people start thinking, you know, World War Three, Russia, China alliance and more. Next thing you know, Iran right. shows up in the middle of this conversation, something that's near and dear to your heart. Right. I want to talk about that here for a moment, because um, you have a deep love for Israel. You look back at the Trump administration for a moment, the amazing Abraham peace accords that happened. Yeah. And, and you think about then where we're at. Just what's your take? What's your update on all that? I know you've been working. Yeah. I, I do work on those issues a lot, honestly. And, and there's a reason we work on those issues, because if, if we can settle the issues with Iran, Iran is the single most destabilizing force in all the Middle East. Uh, a nuclear Iran changes everything. Uh, I have folks that catch me even about, you mentioned uh, Ukraine and what's happening there. Folks will catch me and say, well, why don't we fly planes over Ukraine and, and try to give them the no-fly zone? And I'll say, well, that actually puts us aircraft to aircraft with another nuclear power. And you have to be cautious on that. It, it's different when we're engaging with another nuclear power. And then I'll say to them, that's why it's so important that Iran never has a nuclear weapon. Because we have to treat Russia differently because of this. We have to treat North Korea differently because of their nuclear weapons. We can't have that with the single largest state sponsor of terrorism in the world, which is Iran, that they have a nuclear weapon as well. It's not just a threat to Israel. It's a threat to our security. It's a threat to global security. So uh, I forced a vote in the Senate dealing with the Iran nuclear negotiations because the Biden administration is wanting to give up a lot in the dealing with Iran. They, they want to be known that they got to a deal. And Iran is saying, well, one of the things that we have to have in a deal is you have to lift all the sanctions on the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. These are the individuals that were facilitating the murder of our troops in Iraq. Uh, these bad are the folks. I mean, oh, yeah, they're, they're, it's really a bad group in that. And, I, and my opposition is not the Iranian people. It's the regime that they live under. And so we're trying to be able to keep pressure there on them. Uh, I continue to be able to speak out for, as you mentioned, the Abraham Accords. I serve as the lead person for the Abraham Accords Caucus in the Senate uh, because I think this model that President Trump laid out of nations actually engaging with each other in that region will make an enormous difference. And if no one's read the Abraham Accords before, just go look it up and read it. It begins with a statement of religious liberty. I mean, it's the most shocking thing to think about Israel and Bahrain and United Arab Emirates and Morocco and Sudan opening with a comment about Jews Christians, Muslims, all honoring each other's faith and living where they're in respect for faith. The Abraham Accords don't start with an economic beginning. They start with a faith beginning to say that we're going to engage where we're going to allow for the free exercise of religion among our nations. It's a remarkable document uh, that opens up multiple opportunities for the future. It's got five nations in it now. I'm working to try to get seven, eight, nine, ten. What would happen if that region actually all cooperated together, honoring their religious traditions and also uh, living economically engaged with each other? It's a long term revolution of peace. That's what this is all about. Yeah. You're listening to Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. I'm Dr. Tim Clinton, uh, co host here. Our Special guest, Senator James Langford from Oklahoma, a real voice in culture and here in Washington, D.C., where we're at for the National Day of Prayer. Such a delightful conversation. I wanted to shift to uh, the conversation around life. Uh, you are a strong champion for life. Um, all eyes are focused, obviously, on the Dobbs case and its impact on the Roe versus Wade ruling coming soon. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on this leak that happened with the Supreme Court and uh, just stunning. And uh, what's your take on what's happening, what should happen, what needs to happen? Yeah, so the, this leak that's coming out of the Supreme Court is historic in many ways. Uh, the Supreme Court, people don't know how it actually functions. They're very focused on keeping secrecy there, not because there's something secret, because they're supposed to stay out of politics. It's sure. supposed to be just what does the law say? That's it. What this leaker has done is they've tried to insert politics into this legal conversation and they're trying to get public opinion to be able to sway justices to say don't say what the law says say what we want you to say that it says and that is a, a dramatic shift in what's actually happening in the court now we we don't know 
And at the time when we were recording this, we don't know what the Supreme Court's going to do. They could release out their final opinion at any moment. We know at this point in February that there were five justices that were saying what's obvious to all of us. The Roe versus Wade was not decided constitutionally. Uh, they literally invented a new constitutional something, including this whole viability rule that they imposed on every state. For 200 years of America's history, the abortion issue was decided in states and in legislatures. Yeah. This issue of where does life begin was argued in legislatures, and they determined that. And in 1973, the court took that away from legislatures and said, we don't want the people to decide this anymore. The court is going to decide this. Well, if this draft opinion holds true and what it really is, the court is saying that was a mistake in 1973. The court at that time should not have taken it away from the people. Right. Let the people to decide this hard, difficult issue of when exactly. does life begin. It doesn't eliminate abortion in the country. It just says to the country, go talk about this issue of life. Quite frankly, in my state, Oklahoma, we've already made the decision. We believe that life begins at conception. And our legislature's already put that out there. It said if Roe v. Wade is overturned, in Oklahoma, we're going to honor every single child. There is no child that we consider as disposable. As a matter of fact, your governor, Kevin Stitt, recently signed what some call is kind of a Texas-style law right. on banning abortions. That just happened. It did. Well, I, I would tell you that my governor would want me to say to you, we didn't sign a Texas-style law. We went beyond what Texas did. And so Texas is going to one day have to sign an Oklahoma-style law to be nice. able to keep up with us <laughs> because we actually just made the very clear statement that life begins at conception. Every single child is important and should be actually protected. And that, that basic principle, some would call radical. I think it's radical when someone says some children are disposable and some children are valuable. I, I think that's a radical concept. I don't think it's radical to look at a child and to say that child's precious and what do we need to do to help them? Senator, we uh, live in a country where the majority of Americans want some type of restriction on abortion. That's correct. The majority of Americans, yet we are now seeing states running rogue like Colorado, Maryland, New York, uh, go out to California and more, right. we'll add Virginia, even saying you can have it up to birth. Right, and up to birth, after birth. And in some cases, 28 days after the birth of a child. How do we get to this place? It's unbelievable. Yeah, when you say I'm going to set my own agenda and everything's about my convenience, that's how you get to this place. Uh, when it's no longer about if a child is inconvenient, I can just destroy them. And later when I want to, I'll make another one. It devalues all life for every single individual. And it makes everything in life about me, 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 me. Yeah. That to me is abhorrent. And I look at just the most basic principle of that of not only what it does in our culture, but what it does just to our conversation with each other even. Uh, so for me... I want to continue to be able to stand for the value of every single child and to say, where are we on this? And, and states are going to do this differently. But here's what happens with that. It reopens the dialogue among the American people where we actually start talking about this again. And it's not just about choice and it's not just about convenience. It's about children again. And that's the conversation that we should have, because I, I tell people all the time, uh, there may be laws that make abortion illegal in one state. But we've got to move from talking about it being illegal to unthinkable. There's a big difference between the two. Illegal means you can't get it in the state, but some mom is going to go to some other state and go get an abortion if she doesn't realize what's really going on in her own body. And so for us to be able to provide the opportunity to get information and education to her so that what her gut says, because I'm convinced that every mom when she's pregnant knows in her gut that's a baby. Uh, that's there. There's no sense of that's just random tissue. She knows in her gut, that's a baby. And so we need to move this from being just talking about illegal to also unthinkable. That means compassion for us. That means engagement. That means, quite frankly, holding men accountable to pay child support, uh, to be able to make sure that we're actually as a state helping this mom in every way that we can as she raises this child to be able to have what she needs from a, a man that needs to take responsibility from a culture and from churches and nonprofits that'll help wrap around her as well so that as she grows and as that child grows she can look at that child in the face and say i once considered taking your life but now i'm watching you graduate from high school Amen. and i'm so glad you're right there I've had all kinds of folks that have come to me and said, hey, this is a really bad time for us to talk about abortion. The elections are coming up and everything else. This is bad. And I just smile at them and say, there's not a bad time to talk about the value of children. 
There's just not a bad time. So I, I don't care what the calendar says and what's happening in the election cycle. I believe the vast majority of Americans don't believe in abortion on demand. They don't like late term abortions. They don't like that. Now, there's all these different definitions that are there. I'm not saying everybody's where I am that believes in life at conception. But there are lots of folks that say it should be at a heartbeat or it should be at viability or we could shouldn't have late term abortions. They're not where the vast majority of the left is on this. And the left is going to overplay this. They're going to run out and say, we want abortion anytime, any place we want it. I know. And I think the American people are going to go, no, not there, not there. Let, let's talk about this as a state and make a decision. That's our prayer yeah. for sure. We're fighting the clock here. I have a lot more I want to talk to you about, um, like big tech suppression and censorship, yeah. how uh, people don't trust media. Uh, now hearing about this, quote, ministry of truth disinformation and right. more. You think that issue, you think about parental rights, what happened in Loudoun County down to Florida and more, and how parents are done with all this stuff and they're starting to you know, show up and speak up. The war on men, you serve on the board of Promise Keepers. Yeah. You have a real affection for men to step up and into this moment. Yeah. I'll let you pick something here that's near to your heart <laughs> right before we wrap well, up our all, time all together. The, all those are big to me. Obviously, I spent a lot of time with Ali Mayorkas talking about the Disinformation Governance Board, which is just bizarre. Uh, Americans just seem to go get facts. We need the competition of ideas out there. We don't need government engaging on this. And you are correct. I, I serve on the Promise Keepers Board. I'm very passionate about men actually stepping up and actually loving their wives, loving their children, engaging their community. We need men to be able to step up and care about what's happening in the world and be the Nehemiah, pray and go to work on it. Get engaged, find a task that you can actually go and lead and to be able to help uh, our communities on. And when men just sit around and do nothing, we're missing people in our society that are important to be able to go fight and stand for justice. Senator, in closing, um I had many conversations with Dr. Dobson talking about uh, our times, how they seem so dark and evil. And you can get caught up in that, lament that. Uh, a lot of people are worried about their kids and their grandkids. My daughter, Megan, said, Dad, what's it going to be like for Olivia to grow up? Is she going to enjoy the uh, country that, and the freedoms that we had growing up? She said, it worries me. That's what keeps me awake at night. And of course, reassuring her that God's in control. But let me throw it this way. What I love about you is you're hopeful. Hmm. You're hopeful for America. You love America. Uh, would you say a word to us all here in closing about that hope that's in you? Yeah, I would be glad to be able to share that. I have to tell you, I, I'm convinced that God is at work in our lives individually and in our nation. He has a purpose and a plan for our nation. And he's been carrying that out. We've been the, the greatest missionary sending nation in the history of the world. Uh, because of the prosperity that we've received and individuals have been able to support mission movements all over the world. I, I look at books like First Peter, where Peter is writing to the church in Asia Minor, who at that time had no clue about how to be a walk with God, a completely godless culture. And Peter is writing to them and he's saying, here's what I want you to do. I want you to live as aliens and strangers in the world. Live such good lives among these pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. So Peter is literally writing them going, I know where you live. I know the craziness of your culture and how dark it is. Their, their total misunderstanding of marriage and, and their disconnect with so many different areas and all the things that he lays out in Peter. He says, I know your culture, but here's what you need to do. Live as an alien and a stranger there. Live such a good life that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they would actually come to know God because they see your good deeds and they will glorify God in the day ahead. So I, I encourage Christians not to get caught up in the anger of our culture, but to live such good lives in our culture that will stand out and make an influence. In our culture, it's lost. It's disconnected. It doesn't understand anything about God. So what do we need to do? Model servant leadership. Model the Jesus model on it. From 2 Corinthians 5, it is be the ambassador. Represent who God is. And I firmly believe, again, coming from Paul's words in, in 2 Corinthians, that I used to think of people in a worldly point of view. In fact, I used to think of Christ even that way. But I do so no longer. We are therefore new creations. I, I believe the culture that we live in Christ can transform, but it's my responsibility to be able to live that out, model that. So stop whining, get to praying and working, and start serving people is really where I challenge folks. For such a time as this, and that is our prayer. Certainly, what a delightful conversation. We, I think, know a little better on how to pray for you and your wife, Cindy, your daughters, 
Hannah and Jordan. Yeah. Hannah went to Liberty University. She did, actually. Had a little special affection for that. Senator Langford, again, what a delight. On behalf of Dr. Dobbs and his wife Shirley, the team at Family Talk, um, we salute you and pray that God would continue that great work he's doing in and through you. Thank great. you for joining us. Oh, thanks, Tim, very much. You've been listening to Family Talk, and that was our co-host, Dr. Tim Clinton, speaking with James Lankford, U.S. Senator from Oklahoma. I'm Roger Marsh. If you've missed any of today's conversation, please visit drjamesdobson.org and select the Broadcasts tab. You'll be able to listen to this program in its entirety while you're there. You can also learn more about Senator Lankford and his recent work on Capitol Hill. That's drjamesdobson.org and then click the Broadcasts tab. Or call us anytime, day or night, at 877-732-6825. Well, we're out of time for today, but please join us again tomorrow for another edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.